All right, our sum of the week is 119b, and if you turn with me in your psalter to 119b, this is an alphabetic acrostic, as Elder Greg reminded us, this Lord's Day in his introduction to 119a, the, each of the eight verses of the 22 stanzas begin with a successive letter of the alphabet, so the first eight verses would be uh, the equivalent of A, and then the B selection we have B, uh, and right through the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And Psalm 119 is built around eight synonyms for the law of God, and all eight synonyms occur in the first 11 verses of Psalm 119. So right now we're in verses 9 through 16. Uh, so we have the uh, synonyms for law. We have law, testimonies, precepts, statutes, commandments, judgments. And now we have in verse 9, God's word and his uh, promise. Sometimes these are translated with the same English words, uh, but word uh, here in verse 9, let him with care your word observe. Uh, this is the Hebrew uh, debar, and, uh, and let's see how it's translated in verse 11. It's a, oh, your word. That's actually different in the Hebrew. That's imra. Uh, so it's sometimes hard to tell in the English, but there are um, different, actually, Hebrew words um, for the word word in verses 9 and 11. And 119 uh, is envisioning the law of God as comprehensive for the life of the believer. If we were singing Psalm 119 in the Old Covenant or listening to the Levites sing Psalm 119, we would have been um, anticipating the coming of Christ and the writing of the law on the heart. So in the Old Covenant, the law was written on the tablets of stone, but the prophets were looking forward to the day in which the law of God would be written on uh, the heart. And uh, so a thousand years after um, Psalm 119, that uh, was fulfilled at Pentecost when Jesus ascended to the right hand of God the Father. So the Ten Commandments, uh, this is how the Lord Jesus Christ lived, and he is the one who lived according to the law perfectly. That's why we can rejoice in the law and the testimonies, the statutes, the commandments, the judgments, uh, the word of God. And uh, we then rejoice because he has kept that, and we rejoice because the, this is now on our heart. We can pray that the Lord would impress it even more deeply on our heart, and that we would walk then according to the work of the Holy Spirit. So Heidi is going to lead us as we sing Psalm 118, the B selection. How can a young man cleanse his way? Let him with care your word obey. With all my heart I seek for you. From your commands let me not stray. Your word I've treasured in my heart so that from you I will not turn, that I'll not sin, O blessed Lord. Your statutes teach that I may learn. I have repeated with my lips all of the laws your mouth has told. I have rejoiced in your commands as one delights in purest gold. I on your precepts meditate and I will ponder all your ways. I will delight in your your word remembering all my days. Well, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity not only to sing and to praise you for your word and 
our treasuring your word in our hearts, and uh, we do pray that you would help us indeed to grow more in our love and our, our treasuring of your word. We pray that you would bless the Bible study this evening to that end as we consider your decrees uh, throughout history and the accomplishment as we also think about the work that you have begun in us and that you are bringing to completion. So we thank you so very much that you have brought us to this place in Isaiah chapter 45. We pray for uh, the work of your spirit, and I pray that you would lead us not into temptation and that you would deliver us from the evil one and that you would not allow the evil one to snatch the, uh, the, the seed that is sown, but that it would be fruitful in each and every one of our lives. And those who are joining us on the live stream uh, this afternoon, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we'll be uh, doing a little bit of review. And uh, in the sermon, we looked at, we took a little bit of a break from Isaiah as we had the joyful reception of uh, 13 new members and five baptisms. Our uh, sermon title came from Matthew 13 Blessed are your eyes because they see. And does anyone remember which of the parables that we looked at in Matthew 13? Yep, that's right. So we looked at the parable of the, uh, the sowing of the seed. And who would be the sower in the parable of uh, the sower and the seed? Uh, the preacher, Jesus. Yep, that's, that's right. And the seed represents in that parable the word of God and the soil. It's us, right? It's our, our heart. Um, so Jesus is telling a, a parable about what is happening even now. We also looked at, um, uh, well, we could ask, uh, what is a pew potato? Yeah, it's, a, it's the passive listener. It's not uh, active listening. And uh, with regard to active listening, we also uh, looked at Jesus uh, teaching about why he taught in parables. And one of the reasons he taught in parables uh, was uh, because parables both reveal and hide the mystery of the kingdom of heaven. And we looked at the, the mystery of the kingdom of heaven. And the, um, does anyone remember what Old Testament book the mystery goes back to? It's a word that only occurs in one of the books of the Old Testament. Yes, that's right. Um, th so you only find the word mystery in the Old Testament in the book of Daniel. And Jesus' reference to the, the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, uh, it goes back to uh, just two chapters in the book of Daniel. Uh, ne Daniel chapter 2, uh, the, Neb uh, the, uh, the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had with the kingdoms of the world. Now Jesus is the, the son of man. He is the son of David. And now he is proclaiming the mystery of the kingdom of heaven. Now when uh, Nebuchadnezzar had uh, the dream. He had the vision of, or the dream of different kingdoms with himself being the head of gold. But that dream ended with the stone that was cut without hands and demolishing the other kingdoms of the world. And so as Jesus is preaching the mystery of the kingdom, it goes back to Daniel 2 and the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had that Daniel interpreted um, and the, the mystery that was revealed then but also the vision that um, Nebuchadnezzar had in Daniel chapter 4, and it was a vision that led to his humiliation, his, um, his losing his mind for a, a period of seven years, um, and then uh, God bringing him to his senses and, and looking up to uh, the, the one true God uh, with his uh, confession of faith. The, the word mystery occurs 27 times in the New Testament, referring to Jesus and the kingdom of God and our relationship to it. And uh, the, the, uh, the, one of the things we emphasized is uh, just as Nebuchadnezzar uh, didn't spare any expense in order to understand the mystery of his dream and its meaning and its interpretation, uh, in a similar way, uh, we aren't to spare any expense. Now, of course, Nebuchadnezzar was ready to kill all of the conjurers and the wise men um, in Babylon. Yet the whole educational system of which Daniel and his three friends were apart uh, because he had to know what he dreamed. He, he knew that, but he wanted that being told to him because he realized uh, 
that some god, he didn't, he didn't know the one true God at this point. He destroyed the one true God's temple and uh, taken captive some of his God's people, but he needed to know what he dreamed so that he would know that the interpretation was true. And, and how much more diligent then should we be in uh, making sure and preparing our heart and making sure that the word of God is fruitful in our lives. So just, to, and Jesus goes on to, to talk about how you know, all of the prophets and the righteous men looked forward to the day of Jesus and uh, his teaching and his public ministry and his work on the cross. So there needs to be a diligence uh, on our part. And Nebuchadnezzar serves as a, a good example of uh, that diligence and, and not letting the devil snatch away or let anything, whether it's affliction or persecution, um, snatch away the profitability of the word of God. So there, there isn't an investment that you could make that is too great um, that would be, well, you're just, you're putting too much into understanding the word. There's no such thing as that. And uh, many of the Proverbs are about, you know, seeking wisdom, though it cost all you have, get understanding. So much of the word, we were in Psalm 119, uh, the treasuring of God's word. So there's not, you can't over treasure uh, the word of God. And as, so as Jesus is, is preaching this parable, he would often introduce um, it's in, in all three Gospels. Uh, he would go from town to town, um, but it was always uh, be careful how you hear. And that's where Isaiah 6 also ca comes in in that same parable because sometimes Jesus would teach so people wouldn't understand. And, and, and you say, well, that's, that's not fair, Jesus. But it, the, the very fact that he says that he teaches in parables so that you have eyes but don't see but ear, in the ears that you don't hear is to cause a godly fear. You know, is it is it me that's becoming complacent with the word of God and, and not really caring as if the word of God isn't all that important? So just as it kept Nebuchadnezzar awake at night, um, it wouldn't be wrong for uh, not understanding the kingdom or other aspects of God's word to, to keep us up at night. Uh, there, is, there is nothing more f important for us uh, to, to meditate uh, upon. And then we also looked at some practical ways uh, to prepare and to, to receive God's word and I mentioned some good books. Joel Beakey's uh, book on um, hearing the word of God and preparing for church is a, a helpful uh, way for us to prepare our hearts. Any comments or questions about Matthew 13 and uh, the word of God, Daniel, Isaiah, Rebecca? Yeah, um, th that's a really good question. Um, how can we tell what kind of soil we are um, and the different kinds of soil? So, I don't, yeah, have you, that's a good question. We should all, all think about it. So, how, how do you examine yourselves and, and examine whether or not the, the word of God is being fruitful in your life? John? All right, so you can look at your relationships with other people, and you can ask if the, your relationship would be exhibiting uh, the fruit of the Spirit, things like love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control, um, the, the, the wisdom that comes from above. Uh, so yes, are you seeing that in, in your own, you know, are, or is there a root of bitterness um, in your own heart? So it's, it's your, your relationship uh, with with others, mm -hmm. so that's a very important way we can reflect upon that. So hopefully you are seeing progress. Um, I think I think sometimes we're maybe reluctant. We're sometimes we, or maybe the preacher beats up on people too much, you know, because you haven't yet arrived. You you none of us will arrive in the, until Christ returns or until. Um, we, we are in the blessed presence of God. Um, but yeah, I've been reflecting on, on my own life and there's a particular fruit that God's been working on a lot. And I, ha I, I have seen progress in that. Um, so I'm, I'm very thankful for that. Mm -hmm. Any other ways that you can examine yourself? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so for those who are watching at home, um, Chris pointed out that, and we probably all struggle with um, soil of the heart that's still a little bit rocky or, um, you know, thorny and, and um, or, you know, the, the wayside um, where the devil might snatch it away or uh, the world, the flesh, the devil, right? We're all, it's a constant struggle um, to, to see that that word is fruitful. Um, sometimes, and, and, Really, if I mean that, that's why we have a review of sermons, you know, on Thursdays. Uh, this this is a form of sermon preparation, even though I won't be preaching this Lord's Day. Um, the preparation for the Word really is no different than, say, preparing for the Lord's Supper. You know, as I've pointed out, the um, and 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 seeing that it's fruitful. The, the Lord's Supper is an opportunity for you, us to reflect on the previous week and, and how that word has been uh, fruitful in our lives. Um, but yes, it's a constant struggle. Um, we, uh, we, we do, you might think, well, I do forget a lot of God's word. Um, that's true, but it, it, it becomes a part of who we are, hopefully. Um, you might not remember every meal that you've had, but it becomes a part of you in, in different ways. And, and, that's, and, and that's true in the world. If you're in the world all of the time, it, it kind of permeates, you know, it kind of leaves uh, something, you know, on you. Um, and so we, that's, that's another, sometimes you just don't even realize that uh, the ways that it's uh, affecting you. Um, but yes, if you're always in the word, it, you might not, again, remember those things. Or we need to be reminded of them. I need to be reminded of them. We need to remind uh, one another. I think the very fact that you're here this evening or watching is evidence that you uh, want to understand the Word of God and remember it and apply it. So that's a good sign that you're seeking uh, the Word of God and the opportunities that uh, the church presents, um, especially in a busy week, because there's so many things that can crowd out, you know, daily devotions. And so this is one of those those helps to, to better understand the Word. Uh, going through the Bible, you know, our, our monthly class is another uh, uh, way of, of looking at that. And so th those are opportunities you're, you're taking advantage of and should uh, continue to do that. Mm -hmm. It's uh, a lot of the people that should be, you know, you think of the disciples. They didn't always get what Jesus was teaching, but he still said that their eyes were blessed. But, you know, Peter didn't get a lot of things, you know, and right after Matthew 13 and Matthew 16, um, you know, get behind me, Satan. So there were, there were things that they didn't get. There were things that they didn't believe. But there is that, that progress that you see. Um, and hopefully you see that in your life. And I, as I've thought about, you know, the last 30 plus years of my life, there's been uh, a lot of change. And I'm very thankful. And I'm not complacent with that, I hope, but I, I do see that change. And I'm very grateful uh, to the Lord for that. So if you're not here, you should really be worried. You know, but that's the thing, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody, you're, if you're not here, you're not hearing the word. And you don't really care. You know, there are other things that you have going on. You know, and that, that can be a danger. And I don't mean you have to attend Bible studies. <laughs> um, but if you're not at the worship and, you know, you're, you're, 
the, the book of Hebrews is actually largely about um, like the word of God is living and active, but not drifting away from the word, not uh, forsaking the assembly. So the book of Hebrews is very much a sola scriptura book, and you can see an example of the new covenant church and some of the dangers of falling away from the, the scriptures. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> All right. Um, are there any other comments or questions before we move on to a uh, quick review of Isaiah? Heidi? Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have a bulletin that I could borrow? Um, so Heidi was mentioned for those who are, are watching and, and can't hear the questions, the, um, the importance of not resting our, on our laurels or updating our testimony and, and what is our faith uh, today. Um, well this is a bulletin that doesn't have the printing on both sides. Um, oh, here's the... It is here's another way you can look back on yourself, and it actually happened this last Lord's Day. Um, you, you heard people making confessions of faith publicly, like, do you believe in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments? Do you believe in the doctrine of the Trinity? Do you repent of your sin? Do you submit to the teaching of this church? To the end that you may grow in the Christian life, do you promise that you will diligently read the Bible, engage in private prayer? What you are, are covenanting and giving assent to in the covenant of church membership, th this is like who I am. So another way you can examine your life is, have, have I changed from this at all, or am I growing in it? Um, so it, it is important to say, well, am I engaging in private prayer, keeping the Lord's Day, attending the worship services? You know, those are, those are things that we don't ever uh, graduate from. And if people are kind of going back or not doing that, that would be an indication that somewhere the world, the flesh, and the devil has caught up. And, or you're, you need to struggle with that. All of us are struggling. I don't know if any of those things are easy for any of us. Um, I, at least not for me. Um, so you can look back and say, have I changed? Um, <clears throat> so <laughs> like the, the church hasn't changed, but over like the last 25 plus years, I, I've seen a lot of people follow fall away, literally apostatize, not just, you know, move away, or literally apostatize from the faith. And it's, it's, it's not because the church changed, it's something happened with the word, and, and their, their testimony did change. You can go, if you're married, you can look at your, your covenant of marriage. So here's who I am, have you changed, you know, till death to us part. That's another thing that um, needs to be examined. Uh, the promises that you make when your children are baptized. Th those are things that we need to persevere and be growing in. So that's another way we can, we can look at our lives. So don't just watch the people getting baptized or uh, giving assent. You have to be saying, yeah, I'm, I'm renewing these things too. And, and renewing the, you know, what is a very, I think, a, a bare bones commitment to what is a Christian. Hmm. All right. So let's um, move on as we uh, look at Isaiah 45, uh, finishing up with um, Isaiah 44, uh, beginning 45 again. Uh, last week we looked at Cyrus, we looked at redemption and salvation. Uh, we looked at Cyrus and two of the titles that are given to him in the last verse of chapter 44 and the first verse of fo chapter 45. Remember, it's an artificial chapter division. And what are the two t um, titles that are given to this uncircumcised Persian? Um, close, my shepherd, and the other title, he would be God's uh, anointed, right? The, the Mashiach, the, the Messiah. 
So that uh, the shepherd, this is a very new thing that the Lord is doing. He has been talking about doing a new thing. Uh, if you think about all of the debates about circumcision in the New Testament, this, this is a, a pagan uncircumcised Persian, and uh, he is God's shepherd. Th th these are the same ways in which, for example, David was spoken of in the book of 1 Samuel, uh, David being the, the shepherd, the, the king of Israel, the, um, the, the Messiah, the, the Lord's anointed. So now uh, God, God is using this, and it's very different from Pharaoh, and we'll talk a little bit more about Pharaoh because the Exodus language is a very much a part of this section of Isaiah. And so Pharaoh uh, said, no, I won't let you go. Um, and now Cyrus is saying, I will let you go. So th this is the opposite of Pharaoh. And with what God is saying is that this, what he is doing through Cyrus is going to be for the entire world. Now, last time I mentioned that um, how influential Cyrus was in, in history. I mentioned the Cyrus Cylinder. Uh, there are several passages in the, New T the Old Testament that mention Cyrus. Um, but I, I mentioned last week, so I'm going to correct myself. Uh, I mentioned George Washington making a reference to Cyrus in one of his letters to a Hebrew congregation. He doesn't mention Cyrus by name, so I went over that again. But it's more the, the spirit of Cyrus. Um, it was the, the toleration um, of the United States. So the, the way he speaks to the Jewish congregation in 1790 is very much the kind of toleration that you found with Cyrus and, and his allowing uh, the Jews and the nations to return back. So instead of um, practicing a, a deportation policy where you remove people from their land, he, uh, he sent them back to their land. So we, uh, so we noted the importance of that and how different that was from any other king in the ancient world and really from many rulers uh, to this day. All right, that's what we've looked at so far. Right, any comments or questions before we continuing, uh, continue on? And uh, we'll look a little bit more carefully at the text uh, one last time, and I think we'll be uh, ready to move on from Cyrus um, and uh, progressing in Isaiah 45 in the weeks ahead. All right, let's read from Isaiah 44, beginning in verse 24, and let's read through chapter 45 and verse 7. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, and the one who formed you from the womb, I, the Lord, am the maker of all things, stretching out the heavens by myself and spreading out the earth all alone, causing the omens of boasters to fail, making fools out of diviners, causing wise men to draw back and turning their knowledge into foolishness confirming the word of his servant and performing the purpose of his messengers. It is I who says of Jerusalem, she shall be inhabited and of the cities of Judah, they shall be built and I will raise up her ruins again. It is I who says to the depth of the sea, be dried up and I will make your rivers dry. It is I who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and he will perform all my desire and he declares of Jerusalem, she will be built, and of the temple your foundation will be laid. Thus says the Lord to Cyrus, his anointed, whom I have taken by the right hand, to subdue nations before him and to loose the loins of kings, to open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. I will go before you and make the rough places smooth. I will shatter the doors of bronze and cut through their iron bars." I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden wealth of secret places so that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who calls you by your name. For the sake of Jacob, my servant, and Israel, my chosen one, I have also called you by your name and have given you a title of honor, though you have not known me. I am the Lord and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I will gird you, though you have not known me that men may know from the rising to the setting of the sun that there is no one besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other, the one forming light and creating darkness, causing well-being and creating calamity. I am the Lord who does all these. All right, any questions about Isaiah 45 uh, before we look at three questions from this text? All right, 
three, question, or three questions. Uh, there are some sub-questions here. Uh, lo looking at the text uh, a little bit more closely, who is Yahweh? Uh, th th who is the Lord? So the Lord is all caps so as a reference to Yahweh. What is Yahweh doing and what will he do and why? What is uh, the goal? What does all of this prove and how does it apply to us? So those are some of the questions I'd like to look at uh, carefully from our text. Now, who is the, and as we look at these questions, I'm going to give you an example. So the question is like, who is the Lord or who is Yahweh? What is he doing? So I've put in bold here verses uh, 24 uh, through 26. So this is what we're looking for in the text. Um, who is the Lord? What is he doing? Uh, well, who is the Lord? Well, we learn in verse 24, he is your redeemer. So that is one of the things, who is uh, Yahweh? Now, of course, this is one of the questions that, and we'll, we'll go back to Exodus uh, a little bit later, this is one of the questions that Pharaoh said to Moses, in unbelief, right? Who is the Lord? Who is Yahweh that I should obey him? Uh, unfortunately, Israel kind of lived like Pharaoh. That's why they were going into captivity. Uh, they, they weren't uh, obeying uh, the Lord. They were living like the Canaanites did, whom they drove out in the days of Joshua. So who is the Lord? He is your Redeemer. Uh, who is the Lord? He is the one who formed you from the womb. Uh, what f formation from the womb? What text might that, what does that echo? Hmm? Psalm 139. Yep, Psalm 139. Good. I hadn't thought of that. Any other text that that echoes? Uh, yes, it would. Aramai, um, uh, Jeremiah comes later, um, but yes, uh, the Lord knows uh, Jeremiah and, and chose him from the womb. Good. Uh, Isaiah forty-six. Uh, what are you thinking of in Isaiah forty-six? Okay. So there's another reference to the con well. Where is, what's that referring to? The conception. Uh, yes, it goes back to Israel. And um, remember in the book of Genesis, when um, Isaac marries who? Rebecca, and she's pregnant, and there's a lot going on, and so she inquires of the Lord, and the Lord says there are two nations in your, your womb, right? And there's the formation of Jacob, so that's Israel. So Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. So it's, it's also hearkening back to the book of Genesis, right? The book of beginnings, the book of creation. But God's doing something new and different here. Um, it, it is related, but it's going to be now for the whole world. Who else is, the, who is the Lord? He is the maker of all things. Uh, this is one of the things that's lacking in our society today, isn't it? Uh, we don't acknowledge the Lord who is the, the maker of all things. That is embedded in the, the fourth commandment. So the fourth commandment is a remembrance who is the creator uh, of the heavens and the earth. Um, what does the Lord do? Uh, verse 25, he causes the omens of boasters to fail. So there's this constant competition between a true prophet and you know, false prophets or those who oppose the word of God. Uh, something happens in this day. Um, he causes them to fail. He makes fools out of diviners. What else does God do? He causes wise men to draw back. He turns their knowledge into foolishness. Uh, you might be thinking, well, you know, that, that sounds a, a lot like the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 1. You know, where's the wise man? You know, where's the philosopher of this age? Hasn't God made foolish the wisdom of this world? That was true in Isaiah's day, and of course that was true with the cross. And, and that's where we're, we're heading. Uh, what, is, what, does, what else does the Lord do? This is what we're looking at for, for in our text. He confirms the word of his servant. That's very, very important. That goes back to Isaiah 40, right? The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. So God, it might always be confirmed in our generation, but it, it will be confirmed. Isaiah's prophesying, uh, we'll say, about 100 years before the Babylonian captivity. And, uh, it, but he, the, the word will be confirmed. What else does God do? He performs the prof the. Um, purpose of his messengers. So you should hear his word. You should hear his prophets. This is what Jesus also taught. Um, what else does God say or do? He says of Jerusalem, she shall be inhabited. So there's going to be a judgment, but there is going to be a future. 
she shall be inhabited. Where else does God do? The cities of Judah, they shall be built. And what is he going to do? I will raise up her ruins again. So that's what we're looking for. Now I want you to look at your Bible in Isaiah 44 and now in verse 27 through chapter 45 and verse 2. And I want you to see if you can fr see from the text. So these are, these are some of the most important questions you can ask, like the knowledge of God. Who is God? Uh, like why should I care? Uh, so look at verse 27, Isaiah 44. Who is the Lord and what is the Lord doing or what will he do? Sometimes what the Lord will do is rooted in like previous acts of creation and redemption. All right, so looking at the text in verse 27, uh, who is the Lord and what is he doing? Yes, he's going to dry up the rivers, uh, and he's going to say to the, the depths of the sea, be dried up. Um, now, has, he, has God ever done anything like that in the past? Uh, when? That would be, when, when did rivers or seas dry up? Yeah, the Red Sea. That would be the Exodus. And that would also be Joshua, right? when they entered into the Promised Land, they had to cross the Jordan River. So this is going to happen again. They're going to have to cross the Jordan River back in, uh, in the days of Cyrus. Uh, it'll be a, a different way. Um, now, what else does God do in verse 28? Who is Yahweh and what does he, what does he do? Uh, it is I who, he, he speaks, right? He says of Cyrus, is that verse 28? I say of Cyrus. God is speaking to a king who isn't born. So he, right, we've looked at that. So now, what, who is the Lord and what is he doing? He does this with Pharaoh, right? And Pharaoh doesn't listen. But now God is going to do uh, to a, a similar kingdom and world power um, and who is greater than the Egyptians, by the way. The Persians uh, would actually conquer Egypt. So it was a large, uh, it was a very large kingdom, one of the largest in world history. So he's speaking to um, a, a, a king, and uh, he, he calls him, as we've learned, he is my shepherd. And as he speaks to Cyrus, what is Cyrus going to do for the Lord? He's going to rebuild the temple. And what else? Is there anything that God speaks that he won't do? No, he's going to perform all of my desire. Now, if you're in Isaiah's day, you're like, this is, this is an amazing thing because the Davidic kings didn't even listen to all and do all of God's desire, right? So you're still thinking of Hezekiah was a great king and Ahaz, but th this, he's going to do even greater things, and he's going to do what the, the Lord has, has commanded. And uh, he is going to actually build a temple. So here's an uncircumcised king who is going to be laying the foundations, right, the decree uh, to Jerusalem. All right, who is the Lord? What is he doing? Um, he, uh, he takes Cyrus in verse 1. So what is he doing? I'm going to take you. I, it, it's almost like a father-child, a father-son relationship. I will take you by the right hand. And, and now he is speaking to Cyrus. And what else is he going to do after he takes Cyrus, uh, who's not yet born, but what is he going to do? He takes him by the right hand to do what? Yep, to subdue nations before him. And that's exactly what the, the Persians did. And the, uh, what else is he going to do? Yes. Uh, the loose, the loins, um, the newer translation of the New American Standard. I usually do the NASB 95. There's a uh, 2020 update. They, uh, they translate it this way, to undo the weapons belt of the waist of kings. So instead of loosing the loins, the New American Standard changes. So that's, that's my understanding of loosing the loins, uh, undoing the weapons belt, belt of the, the waist of kings, or stripping kings of their armor, something to that effect. This is a, uh, a peaceable um, king. 
And of course, uh, there, were, there will be nothing that can stand before him, not even the Babylonians. So who is the Lord and what is he doing? Looking at uh, verse 3, so notice again what the Lord is doing. Um, and he's speaking to Cyrus, I will give you treasures of darkness. Um, I call you, in verse 3, here's another thing the Lord does, I call you by name. Uh, verse 4, I have called you by your name. I have given you a title of honor, though you have not known me. Um, verse 5, I am the Lord, and there is no other. Who is the Lord, right? So that's the question, who is the Lord? I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I will gird you, though you have not known me. And the last, in verse 7 of our text, who is the Lord, what is he doing? He forms light, and he creates darkness. He causes well-being, and he creates calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. Maybe next week we'll look a little bit more. That's a verse that causes a lot of consterna consternation in the minds of some people. But what God is saying is that he is, he is a sovereign God. There isn't this dualism between good and evil where God is on an equal footing uh, with good and evil or anything like that. That is that the belief system of uh, the Persian, well, for people in Persia, going back even before the days of uh, David, this yin and yang kind of idea. Um, and, and God is saying, no, no, this isn't like this eternal struggle between good and evil. Um, I form light. I create darkness. Uh, God is, this is another way of looking at God's sovereignty. And here in verse 7, this is the last of four occurrences in this passage of I am the Lord. So uh, throughout this, God is saying, I am, I am, I am. And, and he, he, he continues to do that in, uh, through the end of the chapter in Isaiah 46 and 47 as well. So I am, or I am the Lord. All right, what does that echo, this idea of I am? Yes, Moses, where? The burning bush. Do you remember verse? Exodus 3, verse 14. Uh, I am who I am, thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. So, so Moses is going before Pharaoh saying, let my people go. Now God is saying to Cyrus, holding him by hand, saying, uh, you will let my people go. And that's exactly uh, what happens. So who is uh, the Lord? I am the Lord. That was, that was the big thing with Moses and Pharaoh. Who is the Lord that I should obey him? And now the Lord, Lord is sovereignly working. So just a, a quick rundown here. Uh, verse 11 of chapter 43, I, even I, am the Lord. Chapter 44, I am the first and the last. And chapter 45 and verse 5, I am the Lord. Uh, Isaiah 45 and verse 6, um, there is none beside me. I am the Lord, or I am Yahweh. Uh, verse 7, I am Yahweh who does all these things. Uh, the end of the chapter in Isaiah 45, verses 21 and 22. Uh, declare your case, right? So where are the omens? Where are the diviners? Uh, who, who has announced these things of old? Is it not I? And, and then the Lord uh, reveals in verse 22, I am God. So now he's saying to the ends of the earth, uh, turn to me and be saved. And you'll find the same thing in Isaiah chapter 46 and verse 9. I am God. So who is the Lord? He is I am. This is the meaning of uh, the, the Yahweh. And the, the other thing that is going on here is there, there is no other. There is none other. There is no one like me. So with this emphasis on I am uh, over and over, uh, is there's no savior uh, beside me. There is no God beside me. Besides me, Isaiah 45 and verse 5, besides me there is no God. Um, verse 6, that men may know from the rising to the setting of the sun that there is no one besides me. I am the Lord. There is no other. So constant over and over, uh, not only I am, but there is none other. Uh, and you'll find that in Isaiah 45, and verses 21 and 22, as you see on the slide in Isaiah chapter 46 in verse 9. There is no other, I am God, there is no one like me. 
All right, so what earlier revelation do we have uh, where we have no other? So we looked at I am. Um, that, that would, one of the instances would be the, the burning bush. Um, and of course, Jesus. So we'll, we'll talk about how Jesus appropriates these, these I am statements, not, not uh, tonight, but when Jesus begins appropriating these statements and saying I am, um, th th this, th this is very much a part of the return from exile. And now Jesus is saying that that return from exile, he is the savior. He is the one that was sent by the Father to redeem not only the Jews, but the Gentiles and the ends of the earth. So this emphasis, I am, I am, I am, it, it's, it's echoed over and over and over again as, as the, the remnant is looking forward to the coming work of redemption. And that's what Jesus was proclaiming and declaring when he would say things like, I am the light of the world, or I am the resurrection of life, or I am. Uh, before Abraham was, I am, or I am the way, the truth, and the life. You, you can't miss the, what, what Jesus is claiming for, for himself. Um, so no other. What does that echo? John? Um, yes, that would be the first of the Ten Commandments and the prophets to the, the Ten Commandments, right? I am and no other gods before me. So in Deuteronomy chapter 5, I, uh, I am <coughs> the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Now God is doing something new, right? He's, he's taking them out of um, the, uh, the exile, the Babylonian exile, and uh, no other, no other. So when God says, uh, there is none other besides me, this is part of our life and our witness. There is no other God. Uh, so this is the, the first commandment. Um, it is the, the great commandment. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall <coughs> love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. All right. <coughs> Any comments or questions so far about uh, what, I, what God is revealing through Isaiah? Uh, the, the similarities with the past, but also uh, looking forward to the coming of Christ and the day in which we live because God is envisioning, God is not just envisioning, God is declaring that it, this is going to impact not just the Jews, but it's going to be for the salvation of the world. So the question is why, and I, I think I kind of already answered it, um, but God is uh, revealing here uh, the why. And I, I want you to note here in, in the why, well, can you see here in verses 3 through 6, um, why is God doing this? In fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to zoom in on one of the verses. Um, verse 3 and verse 6. Why is God doing all of this? Yes. Yes. So that you may know. So I, I, again, this is one of the reasons I, I sometimes wonder if someone like Daniel went to Cyrus with uh, the, the scroll or said, explained to Cyrus what, who, who, who Cyrus was <laughs> and, and who he was <coughs> before he was born. Who, not only who he was, what he would do and what he would accomplish. Um, Daniel had that opportunity. There was also another king um, that was taken into captivity, uh, Jehoiachin, Jehoiakim, and the, um, he was taken into captivity, but you might remember that Nebuchadnezzar actually elevated Jehoiakim so that he ate at the king's table. So the, the, uh, at least Nebuchadnezzar, those who came after ba um, him uh, didn't fear the Lord, um, but, at, but Daniel was still around and very influential after the Babylonian um, Empire fell. <coughs> so it, I, uh, again, I can't say for certain, but it does seem that uh, there would have been... Uh, Daniel, you remember, um, he was very close with Darius, one of the, the very powerful men in the kingdom of Persia. Remember when, when Daniel was thrown into the lion's den, Darius couldn't sleep that night. You know, he ran to the next morning, 
um, because of the foolish law that he had passed, the, you know, the law of the, Pe the, Merds, the Medes and the Persians can't be changed. Now, so Daniel had a huge influence uh, also in the, the media and the, the Persian kingdom. And it, it, it doesn't seem like a stretch that somebody, Daniel probably would have had this opportunity. Uh, he would have certainly caught the attention of others when he, he wasn't eaten by the lions. And, and certainly um, what his wisdom was such that it was never um, ignored. Um, in fact, I think he influenced the wise men who later came to worship Jesus after he was born. So, so God is making this known. And in verse 6, there's the, here's the reason again, and this is for us also, right, that men may know. So we're not, we're, we're, we're talking now uh, from the rising to the setting of the sun. So this is going beyond Jerusalem, right? This is going to Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth, that there is no one besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. So monotheism was almost non-existent in Isaiah's day. Um, it was a, a very rare bird, and it looked like it was going to go to extinction, but God says, of course, it can't go to extinction because God is, I am. And, and you look at to this day, and the knowledge of the Lord uh, is filling the earth. So this is, this is, the, this is why. What, what is God doing? Why? So that uh, you might know. So that the world might know. So that's the knowledge of God. So in these, last, these verses, four times, this emphasis, and I've put in bold here, um, so, that you may, uh, so that you may know, though you have not known me, though you have not known me, and unfortunately, a lot of times the Jews didn't know the Lord either. And in verse 6, that men may know uh, from the rising uh, uh, to the setting of the sun. So that's a reference to the, the ends of the earth, that men may know. All right, this is the, the another echo, right? So where else in Scripture have we come across this idea of the, the knowledge of God, the, 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 this, this personal knowledge of God? In other words, the, 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 the knowledge of God, it, it, it's more than just, okay, God created the heavens and the earth. I, I know that. It's, it's that I, he is my God. So th this, this knowledge, the word for know in the Hebrew is a very intimate term. And, and we'll touch upon that in just a second wh where uh, it occurs. But um, so God isn't just saying that there's going to be a, he oh, Cyrus knew because he, there's, there's going to be this personal knowledge, a personal offering uh, of God, uh, of himself. I will be your God and you will be my people. That won't just be for the descendants of Abraham and the Jews. This knowledge of God, this covenant knowledge of God will be for, for us. This is a new covenant, uh, the anticipating the new covenant. All right, you, they, they may know. Can you think of any, uh, where else? Um, let's go before Isaiah. 45, where we've come across this idea before in the scriptures. I think I've mentioned one already, so you can mention it again if you, so yeah, Pastor Aaron said that already. The knowledge of God? There's a lot, actually. Um, I will be your God and you'll be my people. And it, it's before the preface to the Ten Commandments. It's the preface to the plagues. And that's when Moses and Aaron go in Exodus 5. Um, let my people go, right? So let my people go. And then Pharaoh says, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? I do not know the Lord. And besides, I will not let Israel go. Now, uh, God, God's very eager to let Pharaoh know who he is. Uh, he didn't know. And you will, you will know. Now, it's not a saving knowledge, but you will know of the Lord. Uh, it's not that the Lord wasn't offering that uh, to, to Pharaoh, but the, the Pharaoh is now hardening his heart. So I do not know. But now something is changing, right? Because now the heart of man is going to, like mankind, uh, there's going to be a circumcision of heart even for pagans, and a knowledge of God. Um, that's what Isaiah is, is prophesying. It seems impossible, right? They're like the, 
Pharaoh hardened his heart. That was the end. Cyrus, though, there's going to be a different kind of work um, in the Lord's anointed. And, and you remember, and the second generation in Deuteronomy chapter 4 is the next generation who's going to go into the promised land. Um, has a God tried to take for himself a nation from within another nation by trials, by signs and wonders, and by war, and by a mighty hand, and by an outstretched arm, and by great terrors, as the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes? To you it was shown that you might know that the Lord, he is God, there is no other besides him. This is what Isaiah has been echoing all along, so that you might know. You are going to enter in the promised land. Don't harden your heart like Pharaoh. Uh, they did harden their heart, their heart like Pharaoh. Now Isaiah is saying there's going to be a, a, another, uh, an exodus, but it's, it's different from the exodus, but there's going to be an exodus from the promised land, but a return. Uh, another instance of the knowledge of God, and this is an unfortunate translation, but um, it's, uh, it's used of Abraham in uh, Genesis chapter 18. And the Lord uh, says, uh, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? He was on his way to Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, Since Abraham will surely become a great and mighty nation, and in him all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So that's a way of saying that the nations will know the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. For I have known him. Now, I, unfortunately, the NAS, I'm not sure about the others, translates it as I have chosen him. Uh, this is the covenantal, close, intimate term. Um, I have known him so that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. Right? All right. Can you think of any other I, um, I, that men might know? This idea of the not, so it's not just Abraham that God would know. So it would be the nations that would know. Remember... Uh, David, King David, when he confronted Goliath, and he says, God's going to hand Goliath over. Why? That all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Solomon's prayer dedicating the temple in 1 Kings 8.60. May these words of mine, which I have made supplication before the Lord, be near to the Lord our God day and night. May he maintain the cause of his servant and the cause of his people, Israel, as each day requires so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the Lord is God, there is no one else. That's, I, wait, that's Isaiah. Well, I, right, Isaiah, right, pr through the, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he's echoing Solomon's prayer of the dedication of the temple. There would be no temple, right, in the Babylonian exile, but that, that's what Solomon was praying, so that men may know, and, and God is saying, yeah, all men will know. Uh, think of Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 9. They will neither hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Isaiah has already been envisioning that in Isaiah 11, which is a wonderful prophecy about uh, the stem of Jesse. And through this stem of Jesse, the, the earth, the ends of the earth would know. Remember Hezekiah's prayer for deliverance from um, uh, the Assyrians in Isaiah 37? Do you remember that this is the basis of his prayer in Isaiah 37 and verses 18 through 20? Truly, O Lord, the king of Assyria, uh, the kings of Assyria have devastated all the countries in their lands and have cast their gods into the fire. For they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. So they have destroyed them. Now, O Lord, our God, deliver us from his hand that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone Lord, Yahweh, our God. So deliver us so that the ends of the earth, right? That is, thy kingdom come, uh, thy will be done. <clears throat> Jeremiah in the New Covenant speaks this way in Jeremiah 31. This is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin, will remember no more. Uh, Jesus, in John 6, quotes that passage. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. 
everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. So he's applying that to, to himself. Ezekiel, uh, we don't have time, but uh, 73 times they will know the Lord. Sometimes it's in judgment, sometimes it's in the salvation of the new covenant, this idea of they will know the Lord, they will know uh, the Lord. And of course, in 1 John chapter 2, you have an anointing, anointing from the Holy One, and you all know. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie is of the truth. And you think of also the Psalms. You know, think of Psalm 67. God be gracious to us and bless us, and cause his face to shine on us, that, you, that your way may be known on the earth, your salvation among all the nations. So this is the, the knowledge of God. This is uh, most important, a, a personal relationship with the Lord. That's something that's offered through the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is also God is making himself known to the ends of the earth. This is his goal. This is, this is very close to the heart of God. If we, uh, um, th this is why he sent his son to, to, die, to live and to die on the cross. This is why the Holy Spirit has been sent. This ties in with our what we looked at a few weeks ago about you are my witnesses and how do you share the knowledge of God. Um, it, the, we looked at the Romans road. So this is something that we need to be praying that the Lord would kindle in our heart the same uh, desire that not only that I would know the Lord, right? So we want that personal relationship to be growing with the Lord, but we, we should desire that other people know the Lord, right? That's, that's the, the work of, of missions and, and the Great Commission. So you are, you are my witnesses and, and throughout the scriptures that this is one of the great hopes. And, and I, when, I, I, when I think about it, I'm amazed that, this, that men may know, right? I'm, I'm one of those people. I'm, I'm one of those people that we read a lot of scripture just now about the knowledge of God. And I'm, I'm one of those people. And, and I, I hope you are, right? So you, th this is what God ha has for you, to know him, but also to, to make him known. There is no other God like him. And, and this is the wonderful uh, thing that we have to witness to. Do you have any comments or questions before we close in prayer?